Welcome back to Coding Shorts. I'm Sean Wildermuth. I don't have a sponsor or anything today. All I really ask is for you to go down and subscribe to this YouTube channel. That really helps me, helps me know that people are watching and make it worth me actually doing. So any of your help there would be greatly appreciated. In this episode, we're going to be talking about C-sharp dialects. And when I talk about C-sharp dialects, it really comes back to a conversation I had with Jeremy Clark. Jeremy Clark had this idea that because C-sharp is the age it is, that we have a few different versions of C-sharp that people are comfortable with. People who have been in it like me since 2002 might have certain ideas about what works for them in writing C-sharp. People who have come to it much later have seen a later version of C-sharp, and even people that are still running the .NET Framework versus .NET Core are stuck in an older version of C-sharp. And so these different versions have really come up. And I think it affects the understanding of all groups because we don't really have a single idea of what C-sharp is. So I'm going to try something interesting today. I'm going to walk you through several versions of C-sharp and talk about how I would have written the code based on the C-sharp version and talk about some of the limitations, where some features features came from to sort of begin this conversation about do you need to know every corner of C-sharp to be writing good C-sharp. Let's get started. Let's get started. So I'm going to just start with a brand new project. I'm just going to use .NET new here. I'm going to create a console app. And I'm just going to say, put it in the directory I'm already in, and I'll call it dialects. Probably going to spell that wrong several times today. And so this is just a brand new version of a console app. Nothing really special. One thing you'll note if you're coming to this not from .NET Core, from .NET Framework, is that there's one feature of C Sharp that you already can see here that isn't supported in older versions, and that's top-level statements, effectively saying that whatever is in program will be magically wrapped in a void main startup function. But we're going to go all the way back. And how do you go back? running .NET Core, but is the framework you're using really tied to an individual C-sharp version? Yes and no. By default, because I'm using .NET 9 here, and I just have .NET 9 because I have the preview installed, it's going to assume that a certain level of C-sharp exists. So first of all, I'm going to change this to 8 because I don't want to be using any of the preview stuff. And I'm going to turn off a couple of these because implicit usings and nullable or nullable reference types are certainly newer versions of C-sharp. I'm going to add, add one called line version. And you might have done this before to say latest, to make sure that even if you're working with an older version of .NET Core, that you could use the latest C-sharp compiler, 13, 12, 10, whatever you're using. Instead of latest, I'm going to go and say 1.0. Back in the day when I started, I started with the beta of .NET. That's what I wrote my first book based on. There was only one version of C Sharp, and it was 1.0. And it was missing a lot of the features that we think about. And so immediately you're seeing this doesn't exist in the context. And it's giving you a hint that top-level statements are not supported in the language. So let's change this. Let's say public class program, and then we'll create a public static main, void main, I should say. That's going to do something. And what are we going to do here? We're going to say console.write line, hello world, right? So effectively what we had before, but this is what's required. One of the first things you might notice is that this main is static, which is required, but you might say, oh, if this, this is just main, why didn't you put static up there? In fact, in 1.0, static classes weren't available. They didn't come in until the second version of the language. And that's some of the interesting things we're going to run into. Now, if you've come into C Sharp later, it's going to be a bunch of things that you just assume have always been there. They aren't. And so we're going to sort of experience that. Let's go ahead and say run. And the first thing you run into is this feature namespace alias qualifier is not available in version one. What the heck is a namespace alias qualifier? If we open up obj and look at our debug for .NET 8, we're going to see a file called the assembly attributes. And this is the file that is created to specify what version of the framework it's using. And this little key here, this double colon to specify what namespace you're in, doesn't exist in one. So let's just comment that out and see if we can run it now. Now I know this is an object and it should go away, but 
if I'm lucky, it'll now work. So here we can see that it returned that hello world, and that's great. Really simple app, but let's do something different here. Let's say I want to create a collection of objects, and I could certainly say something like string, this will be my array equals new string, and let's say that there's five in it. Now you'll notice a couple of things. I had to specify that string is the type. There is no var keyword yet. Just like we saw before, if we're going to use var there, it's going to immediately complain. This doesn't happen until version three of the language, etc. So let's leave it at that and let's assign some data so let's say array zero is going to be hello and array one is going to be world and immediately you can see that this starts to become a little bit more wordy a lot of the stuff that c sharp does over time is trying to be a little bit more friendly here and let's go ahead and say for each string and i'll call it message in array then we can say console.line message and that's kind of as good as we're going to get so let's run this we're not gonna get hello world, but because it's five, we're actually getting three empty lines because we didn't assign something to each one of those. What we might wanna do in most programming is be able to grow this array as we need. And there's a class still available called ArrayList that allows us to do that. ArrayList doesn't have a specific size. We'll need to bring in that system.collections in order to get that. And then we can just change these to add. We don't need to think about individual types here. I should be able to good to go. Array is still going to be something I can iterate over. None of that's changed. Let me just get the two hello world. Well, if you haven't used ArrayList ever, it's probably because you never worked with 1.0 of C Sharp. And so if you see this in code, you'll know why. Because in C Sharp, there weren't any generics. So this is as close as we could get to handling generics. There's a lot of casting off and, and pulling stuff out of an array list because array list just holds a collection of objects. What you're probably used to is something like this, a list of string, right? Of course, this doesn't work because we're not in version two. Immediately come into some of the dialects. You're not gonna see a lot of 1.0 code, but I want you to really see sort of as the language matured. So let's go back to our dialect and let's go way to 2.0, big, big, Big change. This was really the main stable version, and it was a stable version for quite a while until C Sharp and .NET 3 came around. Once we do that, list works fine. In fact, we might want to do this as a var, but again, we're still one version before we can start to do that. And unsurprisingly, this works in exactly the way we would expect. We can even simplify this to say array dot for each something added in the list message console dot right line message. Now this should work. You've probably done this in your code, right? Lambda didn't exist in 2.0. Again, you need 3.0 for that. So what did we do? We created a public static void write. Let's say we're going to take a string called message. You probably know where this is going. And then we could give it the name of our method and it'll use that, right? We don't have Lambda, so we can't create these anonymous things. We need to create actual known methods to do this. If we run this again, same experience, right? And 2.0, the big change was generics. And it took a lot of people some time to really get used to this idea. Generics changed the landscape in some major ways. You can see Microsoft is trying to do here is to make the language easier to write, where you're doing less of the semantics of dealing with objects, but being able to deal with things in a more natural way. So let's move to our next version. I'm not going to cover all 13 versions, but these were some major milestones, so I really did want to cover them. And so here, of course, we could change this to the Lambda. We could say message and now we're in the friendly world of being able to use lambdas as well. And 3.0 brought a few different things. The reason lambdas were introduced so quickly is because we needed them for link. In fact, the var was important there as well. Let's say the results from message in array where message starts with select message, right? I think that's a bug in the compiler. Let's go ahead and try to run there. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's complaining here, and it's complaining because it's missing a namespace, system.link, which again, in most standard things we're doing. And so here we can just say, for each item in result, write our item. The idea of using link here changed fundamentally in the way we wrote anything that was really a for loop or searching through and those sorts of things. It made it much, much easier for us to do this. Should only get hello after this. Remember, we're still writing out to the console there, the hello in world. 
The other thing that came in with this new version were nullable primitives or nullable value types, I guess is the right way to say it. So if I say integer x equals zero, this isn't x. So if I say y equals x, just so that we say we're using it, this is fine. But if we add that question mark, which a lot of us have gotten familiar with nullable reference types, we suddenly were allowed to have a nullable type. And what do we do with that? We can say if x has value, and y equals x dot value. Now, why only value types? Because reference types, like a string, have been supported the whole time. So the idea of nullability has always been there for reference types, but not for value types. In a later video, I'll actually discuss a lot about reference types and value types and stack and heap. That's coming up. It's just taking a little while to get that one together. But I'm going to stop at a very special version, 7.3. Those who know, know. Those who don't, I'll explain. .NET 7.3 is the latest version of c -sharp that you can still use on the .NET framework. All the versions after it are limited to .NET Core. And so a lot of people that are working on systems that still rely on the .NET framework are stuck at this version. And so it has a lot of these different ideas, but we can see that the dialect of what looks like what it does in 7.3 can be really different as we go past into the .NET Core space. What some of the versions allowed us to do was to actually fix this. There's actually a little light bulb there because we can change this to just an array indexer instead of putting it in. This will allow us to just convert this to an array initializer to make this a little simpler. Instead of having add or add range or whatever, you can actually generate these in the simplest way possible. In later versions of .NET, this becomes even smaller, but we're not there yet. And one of the bigger changes has been with the way we write methods. After three, and I think it was in four, but might have been in a later version, we allowed our ourselves to have, let's say, a prefix equals blank, a default value for an argument. In fact, let's create two, and I'm just going to put these on their own line so that we don't, we know what we're dealing with every time. And here we'll just say prefix plus message plus suffix. And I know this isn't the most friendly way to do this, but for now, I'm just going to do it that way just for brevity and clarity. I worried about a lot for a long time. And so that means our write items here continue to work. We're still writing each of the messages and then we're doing this. But here we could say from link as a prefix. And we can see the line here from link hello, right? So we're allowing ourselves to do that. In fact, what if we just want a suffix? We might think we're going to have to do something like that. But in fact, the other thing it's allowing you to do is say suffix link. So it's allowing you to specify the parameters by name, not just by position. So if we do that, you should be not surprised at all to see our hello with link on it, right? And if you're still using .NET Framework, this can be a really major thing for you to think about. And that is a lot of these features are really helpful and can make your code a certain way. But a lot of the functional stuff, the stuff that has made it work in a more functional way are beyond this. They're in 8 up to 13, which is the current version. So let's actually cross that line and go into 8. Again, I'm not going to cover every version, but I want you to just see what happens then. And we're also going to come up here and we're going to say nullable equals enable. Because in 8.0, that's where nullable reference types came from. Now, I have a whole video on nullable reference types, but just to talk about it really quickly, this no longer works because reference types can't be given the value of null until you specify that same thing that we had way back with value types. And the purpose of this is to really allow you to specify what can and can't have a null instead of every reference type being able to be null and having to check null in so many different places. If you know it can't be null, then don't put the question mark on it. Only when you know it can be a null value. And so we can do this. We can say if z is null, z equals goodbye, right? Now you might be used to this if z is equal to null, but we can now start to use some expressions. Expressions allows us to say is null. By using is null, we're actually doing this in an expressive way. It certainly makes the code a little clearer, but also it portends the future where we're gonna be using expressions for more and more things. Switches are a big deal. You're gonna see expressions in a bunch of different ways that allow you to think about your code in a more natural language way. That we're not always testing equality, we're testing 
interesting identity with is this thing set to null? Otherwise, we can override it, right? And also introduced back then was implicit usings. And this basically says for all the really major using statements we have, they're just going to be there. We don't need to include them unless it's for things that just aren't used very much. There's a whole list of what the implicit usings are. It's going to be system and system player collections and link, and you're going to see a, a number of them there. But that makes our code a little easier. And in fact, the real magic, that is use top-level statements. So this code, instead of having program and main, just becomes this. Instead of public static, we can just say void now, format that all. And up to version 9, which is pretty much the last one I'll talk about, there's a bunch of features that come after 9, but this introduces some of the other big things. And if you're used to void main as being the starting point, or you're starting to look at the way that things are built, there's this idea of top-level statements. Again, I have a whole video on them, but just let's refactor this because this is going to make our code look different yet again. So this just becomes void write. Let's get rid of this nasty thing. And so our code just becomes, might as well be a Python script, right? You can start to look at this in a very much more natural way of writing console apps, startup for things like ASP.NET Core, etc. It's just going to be a much more natural way to write code. Doesn't mean that everything else isn't going to be a class. And it doesn't actually mean that this isn't a class. This is just wrapped up by the compiler in a program main. Just a little sleight of hand to allow you to think in those ways. And so let's go ahead and change this to latest, back to where we began with latest. And there's a couple of things that have come in. First is the idea of a record, which I think was supported in 9, but I may have jumped the gun here. So public record, let's say person, and here I can just in a very brief way say that this is a string for first name and a string for last name. And this record could also be a struct so that this is a value type. And records, again, I have a whole nother video on them. I'll put a bunch of these video links if you want to delve deeper into it. Our quick way to make these shapes without having to create a whole class structure around them. And the other thing you'll see as well is, let's call it payment. I'm just going to use a similar syntax here where I can just say double amount and string comment. And I can say description. And because I'm going to write code somewhere in my class, these are just available available inside the class. Not only are we not passing them in or needing a special constructor, this just means it's going to construct it from here and it's going to live within the class. It's not going to be public. It's going to live in the class. So I can just say amount comment. Now, if you haven't seen string interpolation that way, whole another thing that's also a somewhat recent addition, a way to very simply concatenate those strings. And the truth is, I'm going to do something kind of silly. We have all this working. Let's go all the way back, and I'm just going to undo until we get there. All the way back to that version 1. We're not changing the dialects to support version 1. We're still in the latest version. But the reality here is, I almost passed it, is this still runs, right? Same thing we got in the beginning, right? None of this has gone away as a way to write code. So let's talk about the idea of dialects. There isn't a right or wrong way to write C Sharp. You're going to see some newer techniques that can make your code maybe more readable or simpler to use or whatever the case may be. It doesn't mean that you're doing it wrong, but it sort of implies that as people who are, let's say, on 7.3 because they're stuck in .NET Framework, or they may be in older versions like 3.0 because they're using .NET 3.5 for some specific things, you're going to be using older versions of C Sharp. So when you go out and search for answers to things, you're going to see code that looks different. And so even if you can't write those different versions, it might be useful for you to keep up in some very subtle way with where C-sharp is going. The thing that has come up is that people don't like the C-sharp language now because they've moved their cheese. They've changed the way it looks. They've been writing it for 20 years. Why do they need to change now? And again, I don't think you need to change. I think that bristling against change is really fighting uphill. You're trying to swim upstream. I think sort of embracing it as much as you can will really benefit you as a developer. Doesn't mean you have to like it or certainly not agree with every decision they've made. There are things in the language not a big fan of, but on the whole, I still really enjoy writing C Sharp. If you disagree or you want to just rant to me what you hate about the new C Sharp, please go ahead and down in the comments. Let's have that conversation. I'm not a tender flower. Be as rough as you need to be. 
Thanks for joining me. Again, like and subscribe it helps me in a big way. I do have some Pluralsight courses that are still available. So if you have a Pluralsight subscription, please take a look at them. I have uh, Designing REST APIs. I have a new version of my gRPC course coming out fairly soon, and I'll let you know when that happens. And of course, my ASP.NET Plus View course is still there, and it was just released a few months ago. So thanks for joining me on this episode of Coding Shorts. I'll see you next time.